So for the next session, I would invite uh, Professor Dr. Rakesh Shahai. He's a well-known person and he's a professor of endocrinology, Usmania Medical College. And he's the honorary secretary for the prestigious Endocrine Society of India. And he's also a executive member of RSSDI. And he's the associate editor of uh, IJEM also. And he was awarded the fellowship of American College of Endocrinology as well as uh, Indian College of Physicians. And he has more than uh, 70 publications in the various national and international journals. And he is uh, uh, authored ch chapters in the Endocrine uh, Society textbook also. So I would uh, request the Professor Rake Sakai for the non-invasive management of uh, nodular and multinodular guiders. Thank you. Thank you, Chairpersons. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, particularly Krishna, Dr. Krishna Sheshadri and Dr. Muthu Jayapalan for having invited me here. Uh, so the topic uh, given to me is about uh, the ma non-invasive management of nodular and multinodular goiters. We know that uh, go goiters are very common and if you look at the global prevalence, it's uh, more than 2 billion and more than 40 million people in India probably have uh, goiters in about 200 million people are at risk of iron deficiency disease in India. So. And if you look at the overall prevalence of thyroid disorders, various forms of uh, thyroid disorders, you would find that it ranges from about 7 to 10 percent. And, uh, and of these, thyroid cancer is relatively rare. The incidence is 8.7 per uh, 100,000 people year, per year. Although this seems to be small, but this is increasing. Uh, pre this prevalence has been increasing over the years. And the task of the clinician, therefore, is to distinguish uh, between these benign malignant swell benign from these malignant swellings and uh, by by not only a good clinical evaluation but also um, along with uh, appropriate investigations particularly the ultrasound we've heard uh, heard about the ultrasound how the thyroid score is going to help us and also by other uh, FNACs and other uh, scoring systems that are available. So I will not be discussing about those scoring systems but discussing about uh, managing these uh, nodules which, are which have uh, sort of uh, sh uh, which are, are, are rather, uh, we are quite clear that they, they are benign. So if you look at the uh, detection of nodules, it depends on the method that is used. If you look at just palpation, we may miss out on a lot of nodules which are otherwise picked up by, uh, by, uh, uh, by ultrasonography. And then if you look at autopsy studies, they, have, they pick up a huge number of nodules which are not uh, picked up um, in, uh, otherwise by clinical evaluation. So if you look at uh, uh, these differences, you find, find that differences uh, uh, are seen in terms of you look at uh, population studies which are looking at clinically uh, evident nodules, you find that the prevalence rates are lower. But if you look at ultrasound detection rates, they are higher. And, uh, and if you look at autopsy studies, again, the rates, are, the rates of uh, detection are much higher. And uh, we know that uh, iodine deficiency is one common cause for uh, goitrogenesis and then you have exposure to radiation which increases the risk for uh, certain ca cancers, particularly uh, the um, uh, papillary thyroid carcinomas and then there's, there is uh, uh, other factors like family history of thyroid cancer is another uh, factor which uh, probably all these uh, uh, ind predispose the individual to have, uh, have uh, thyroid nodules or and if you look at uh, the features which could suggest, uh, su uh, which would give a high suspicion for uh, uh, for uh, uh, some of these uh, features are listed out here. So I'm not going to details of this, but uh, I would go on to say that uh, if you look at the non-toxic simple goiters, they they may start off as if you look at the natural history of these goiters, they may start off as uh, as uh, as diffuse goiters, which then over a period of time, over 10 to 15 years of follow-up, you would see that they start developing nodularity, nodularity and uh, maintain normal thyroid function and later they may go on to develop autonomously functioning nodules which, which become uh, thyrotoxic. If you look at multinodular goiters, typically the prevalence uh, m uh, may range in the range, uh, maybe in the range of over 12 percent of the adult population. They are more common in women characterized by difficulty in swallowing and, and uh, the pressure symptoms and and they could include, uh, they could uh, uh, subsequently become uh, toxic and uh, other features like hoarseness of voice may, uh, may be indicative of malignancy. Pulmonary function test may be used to detect compression and detect trichomalacia. And uh, imaging modalities may be required to uh, evaluate the anatomy of these goiters and, and to look for any substernal extension. 
So evaluation of the nodule is not uh, what I am going to discuss today, but I just wanted to briefly uh, just put this in front of you uh, to show that uh, you know the, the sequence that has to be followed is a good physical examination, then a TSH and then look at the thyroid uh, ultrasonography, then you look at the cytology and then you have uh, different cytological uh, uh, tests available, you can do molecular uh, genetic studies and and then, uh, so I am not discussing all this, this is going to be discussed tomorrow, we have a session on this and I think Dr. Nikrishnan is going to discuss this tomorrow, uh, which molecular test to use and, and these, are, uh, these are areas which are very interesting and which will be discussed tomorrow. But uh, and then the other fact is the serum calcitonin should also be uh, done in such situations because the they, they could help in picking up medullary thyroid carcinomas. But if you look at uh, the outcome of these cytological investigation, you will find that a large chunk of them are, are benign, 70 to 80 percent of them are benign. And then there they are, they are a whole lot of them who have, uh, you know, who are in this intermediate zone, inadequate biopsies, definitely malignant, then they are suspicious ones and then then they are, they are the follicular neoplasias where again you are, you, are, you are not very sure about what the histology, only the histology is going to help you out. So in all these ca cases, this is not what I am discussing, I am discussing about these benign ones where you, uh, how you are going to manage them, what are the options available, what, what has been tried. So this is what I am discussing about. Uh, well, so the, if you look at the natural history of a non-toxic multinodular goiter, uh, it generally keeps increasing in size with the development of multiple no nodules and the annual growth rate may range from anywhere, it may just stay, stay at the same uh, size or it may start, uh, it may grow to the extent of about 20 percent per year and the five-year incidence of hyperthyroidism is to the tune of about 10 percent. Clinical manifestations are, uh, are mostly related to the growth and also the functional autonomy. Local pressure effects and cosmetic complaints are the major issues. So. Uh, it is mandatory to rule out malignancy in each of these uh, uh, each of these uh, situations, and FNAC is very important. There is no simple relationship between the size and symptoms many a times, and it is difficult in deciding whether to treat or not to treat. Asymptomatic subjects with relatively small goiters observation may be the uh, may be acceptable, although many have this potential of growing further. So therefore, you may need to use some form of therapy to uh, to sort of uh, look at this. So surgery is definitely the choice in those who have the suspicion lesions who, where malignancy is shown and um, but for those other ones which are definitely benign then there is a, there's a reconsideration on, on, on uh, non-surgical modalities or non-invasive modalities because surgery is definitely a good choice in all these situations but there are many patients who don't want to go for surgery and uh, so in such situations uh, there is a uh, this article has actually reviewed all this and has said that there is a time to reconsider non-surgical therapy for these benign non-toxic multinodular goiters. And the options that you have, these non-surgical uh, non options that you have are the, the thyroxine suppression therapy or uh, uh, percutaneous ethanol injection, radioiodine therapy which could be just radioiodine or now you have the recombinant TSH which helps in improving the efficacy of this radioiodine therapy. Then uh, laser ablations, radiofrequency ablations, these are briefly what I will be discussing in the next uh, 7 or 8 minutes. So uh, if you look at the levothyroxine suppression, uh, suppression, it is aimed at shrinking the nodule size and arresting the further nodule growth and preventing the appearance of new nodules. Nodular, nodular goiters are less responsive to, L, uh, to thyroxine suppressive therapy than, than diffuse goiters. So diffuse goiters are more responsive and, uh, and if you look at 50% uh, uh, reduction nodule size as a, as a measure of, measure of saying some, showing some success, then it is seen only in 20% of, uh, of those who have palpable thyroid nodules. And the observed beneficial effect may be sometimes because of the decrease in the uh, perinodular thyroid tissue rather than reduction in the nodule size itself. And uh, uh, this is what has been shown that if you, uh, some people have also tried uh, using uh, 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 carmazole along with uh, thyroxine to see whether it Im improves the efficacy in terms of reducing the nodule size, but that has not been shown in this. The best effect was seen with thyroxine itself. And uh, but the problems are that there is regrowth of the nodules to baseline levels within one year of cessation of therapy. So therefore, you need to continue it over a long period of time. And then there are diff effects on quality of life. Uh, uh, and various other outcomes like uh, the skeletal and uh, effects are very significantly important. Dr. Dinesh had just highlighted this and so this may be an important issue in terms of in old elderly people who are prone to osteoporosis and then cardiovascular health in terms of uh, precipitating atrial fibrillations is another, another issue that has to be kept in mind. So therefore, it is not recommended for routine use uh, by most of the recent guidelines and reviews and it may be considered in patients who are from iodine deficient areas, younger patients with smaller colloid nodules and smaller multinodular goiters with no evidence of functional autonomy. 
the goal is to keep the TSH in the range of 0.1 to 0.3 and uh, this could be tried for about 6 to 12 months and uh, you could look at the response. And uh, if you look at different guidelines, they are also saying that they are putting it as a grade 2C indication for treating youth thyroid patients with diffuse or nodular goiter. And they have selected these groups of patients to be uh, responsive. And the other thing is that it's not useful in pa if pa TSH is already subnormal. If it is already suppressed, then it's TSH uh, thyroxine therapy is not of any use in such situations. Then if you look at iodine supplementation, you find that uh, this can be effective in reducing uh, a diffuse goiter. And uh, in a control trial which was performed with I in an iodine deficient area, a dose of 400 milligrams of iodine during 8 months was as effective as, uh, as 150 micrograms of thyroxine reducing the size of endemic goiter. So it's particularly useful in iodine uh, deficient areas and it's not been evaluated in multinodular goiters but doesn't seem to be better than the thyroxine therapy. The concerns with iodine use are that it can suddenly increase the, uh, increase the uh, predisposed to thyrotoxicosis. So sudden increase in iodine intake may actually predispose thyrotoxicosis and there's also uh, the concern regarding the incidence of uh, increasing the incidence of papillary thyroid carcinomas and lymphocytic thyroiditis. So therefore, that's not a very uh, good uh, sort of form of therapy that is considered. And if you look at uh, percutaneous iodine in, uh, ethanol injection, uh, that is particularly good for the cis cystic lesions, probably do better in terms of that. You use 95 percent sterile ethanol is administered under sonographic control by a 22, 20, uh, 22 gauge needle without any CCR or any so form of sedation. The amount of alcohol depends on the size of the lesion and uh, the procedure can be uh, in experienced uh, hands it could be good without any uh, without much of complications. The, uh, the way it works is that it causes cellular uh, dehydration, proteins are denatured followed by development of necrosis, fibrosis and thrombosis of the small blood vessels. In this way, a reduction of nodule size and disappearance of nodules can be achieved. Uh, it produces, as I said, it produces best results in cysts and uh, it has been used for other cysts also like parathyroid cysts also it has been used and other cysts in the neck and can replace surgery in such situations. It has even been used for uh, injecting into uh, secondary hyperparas where the, or, the, or we could say tertiary hyperparas in renal patients with renal failure it has been used. Results are generally achieved after the first injection itself. Sometimes there may be need to re-inject also and uh, volume reduction is to the tune of about 50 to 95 percent depending on the size of the lesion and the content of the cyst, whether the content was uh, cyst was clear having clear fluid, colloidal or hemorrhagic fluid and the presence of solid tissue in that. If the presence, the extent of solid tissue is less then you get a better response. There was some concern about carcinogenic effects of percutaneous ethanol injection. And this was addressed in this study by a uh, study which was published in 2011. They looked at uh, 39 patients with, uh, with uh, um, thyroid nodules who had this uh, percutaneous uh, ethanol injection and then they followed them af after a mean of 17 months. They did FNSE again and looked at them and they found that there was no malignancy reported in any of these and it was seen in any of their uh, patients or uh, these 39 patients. And uh, but however what they found was that the uh, proportion of moderate to intense macrophage infiltration decreased from 60 to 15 percent. Mean volume also decreased from 13 uh, plus or 13.4 to 5.3 centimeters. And uh, however, there was an increase in the number of non-diagnostic or unsatisfactory uh, FNACs, suggesting that uh, you know when you are looking at uh, cytological uh, findings after a percutaneous ethanol injection, you should be uh, doing it cautiously because these changes are expected after ethanol injection. So this is something which has to be kept in mind. Then the other form of therapy is the radiofrequency uh, ablation for thyroid nodules and uh, you can, uh, this is done with uh, the use of high frequency alternating electric current oscillating between this, these frequencies. It uh, causes coagulative necrosis and irreversible damage at electrode temperatures between 50 and 100 degrees centigrade. So it produces this fictional heat and then also it damages the surrounding areas in a slow manner. Uh, and uh, uh, this can be accompanied by again uh, with uh, you know it depends a lot on the person who is doing it, the skills of the person who is doing it and um, uh, problems like uh, nodule rupture or pain and all these uh, can uh, come uh, transiently you could have these symptoms and then uh, you have uh, more severe problems like tracheal injury, esophageal injury or permanent voice changes and brachial plexus injury have also been reported. So this is a uh, lot of it is dependent on the operate, on the person doing it. Then you have uh, laser photocoagulation which is also uh, done and this study showed that they started off with 74 patients uh, and uh, who had 45 of them had cosmetic complaints and they and you could see at after about one year of follow up that this was the uh, extent of uh, these uh, problems. So showing that this is quite effective, uh, however regrowth of nodules is a possibility because total tissue ablation does not happen and uh, it does have some adverse effects. 
and uh, you know this is and uh, the response depends on several biological biological characteristics like vascularity of the nodule degree of pre existing fibrosis and the amount of colloid can determine how 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 good the response to laser photocoagulation is and uh, the um, the procedure is highly operated, operator dependent again and uh, large scale studies are required to sort of compare these different therapies to see which one of them works better in terms of uh, you know over a period of follow up. Then you have the radio iodine therapy for multiple uh, for these non toxic multinodular goiters. They uh, bring about a 40 percent reduction at one year and at 3 to 5 years you could s uh, expect a 50 to 60 percent reduction. The problems here are that. Uh, uh, up to 20 percent of patients do not respond to I-131 therapy that is one issue. Second thing is that uh, these multinodular goiters have a low, low normal TSH most of the time. They are associated with low I-131 uptake and there is a need to increase this activity and therefore you need to give higher doses. So higher doses if you now as per the regulations of the government of India if you are giving more than 30 millicurie then you need to uh, admit the patient. Bef below that you can probably give as outpatient. So what has come to rescue is the recombinant uh, TSH which helps in increasing the uh, uptake of uh, radioactive iodine. So this is uh, before uh, the baseline scan and then with radioactive iodine you see with uh, sorry recombinant TSH you find that there is increase in uptake and then this is the post uh, 30 millicuries uh, ablation dose. So you find that uh, with recombinant TSH you could increase the uh, sort of uh, binding of uh, iodine to this uh, to the to the uh, to the receptors the sodium iodine is importer and uh, probably it vacates the iodine mimics from that and different studies have looked at that and they have shown good results in terms of uh, goiter reduction depending on the dose. So a dose of 0 0.01 is uh, or 0 0.03 has been compared and they find that uh, you know at, at a dose of uh, 0 0.03 to 0 0.1 milligram is the dose that is recommended and one injection taken 24 hours before the before the before the I131 injection. And if you look at the goiter volume reduction, you find that the, uh, it, whether you look at smaller goiters or larger ones, you find that there is improve ex, uh, good improvement with the recombinant TSH use. And the determinants could be the initial goiter size, the retained thyroid dose, and uh, different individual susceptibility factors could also play a role. And in this study, again, the use of recombinant TSH itself was a very good, very important uh, in the uh, uh, factor in the regression analysis. All the other factors did not score out well as much as the use of recombinant TSH. So recombinant TSH does uh, show a good benefit. And uh, what are the problems with that acute effects? You could have acute effects with uh, TSH. It could increase the vascularity of the gland. It could increase the uh, release of uh, T4 and T3, which peaks at about 24 to 48 hours, followed by a normalization three to four weeks. So you could have uh, uh, you could have uh, the response. I mean, uh, use of uh, pretreatment with uh, uh, I want uh, recombinant TSH did not affect the structure and function parameters of the heart. I mean, although th these people presented with se severe tachycardia and other features of thyrotoxicosis, uh, these are something which this is something which has to be kept in mind. And then you could have acute swelling of the thyroid gland within the first 48 hours, thyroid in size in increase in size, and then cervical pain or tenderness, and increase in stress of radiation induced thyroiditis can be seen with, with the use of recombinant TSH. Long term effects can also be seen like fivefold increased risk of permanent hypothyroidism as compared to using, using I131 alone, and the appearance of TSH receptor antibodies, long term risks of thyroid, extrathyroid, and malignancies. Uh, one good uh, point here is that when you use recombinant TSH, you get more of the iodine going into the thyroid itself. So extrathyroidal malignancy uh, tissues are get, get less exposed to the iodine and the risk of extrathyroidal malignancies comes down with the use of recombinant uh, TSH. This was the uh, Cochrane review which came out this year which looked at all the modalities except uh, uh, radioactive iodine and it, show, it uh, looked at uh, some 2,952 patients over 31 studies and they found that uh, uh, although no study evaluated all cause mortality and health related quality of life issues, they just looked at the nodule characteristics and, and the reduction size and all that. So it was seen that on all these studies, the uh, meta analysis of these studies showed that there was improvement in pressure symptoms and cosmetic complaints. And the adverse effects such as light to moderate periprocedural pain was seen after, um, after these uh, procedures that is percutaneous injections or the laser or radio frequency ablation. So they concluded that future studies should focus on patient important outcome measures, especially health related quality of life and compare minimally invasive procedures with surgery. So I think I would conclude by saying that uh, whenever we see a patient with uh, 
with nodules, we need to assess, uh, distinguish the benign from the malignant. We use all these uh, modalities of investigation that are available with us. And uh, the, uh, the major problem is that there is high prevalence of these indeterminate cytology cases. And uh, surgery is required for all those who are found to be malignant or suspicious cytology, whereas uh, the, the uh, for the uh, for the non uh, for the benign ones, again, if uh, they are very huge and cause compressive symptoms, again, surgery is a very very important uh, modality of treatment. For those without compressive symptoms, there is emerging role for non-surgical alternatives. Iodine supplementation and levothyroxine have limited role to play, as we have seen. Uh, percutaneous ethanol injection, uh, laser photo uh, coagulation and radiofrequency ablation have shown some promise and recombinant TSH augmented I-131 therapy is a promising new strategy in these patients. I thank you all for the patient attention and bring you greetings from. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Hi, can you join us for the question and answer session?